Добър ден на всички. Уважаеми господин Добрев. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Dobrev, chairperson of the Energy Committee of National Assembly of the Republic of Bulgaria and host of our conference, esteemed members of the delegations uh, of uh, parliamentary committees within the European Union and the European Parliament, esteemed uh, representatives of EU candidate countries, esteemed uh, representatives of uh, the states from the Western Balkans, excellencies, dear guests. Allow me to welcome you to Sofia, our beautiful capital, which from the beginning of 2018 has been the focus of all the uh, important topics of the European agenda. This is the fifth month of Bulgaria's presidency of the European Union, which uh, came rather unexpectedly, I would say. And this is um, the fifth month of the parliamentary dimension of this presidency. So today I have the honor to open the meeting of uh, the uh, parliamentary uh, energy committees. It is a topic where Bulgaria is very active. Among them, the energy structure of the Union, security of supply, transition to clean energy in Europe, and the market integration of renewable energy sources. The key topics of Bulgaria's presidency are uh, building a stable energy union, the uh, proposals from the clean package, uh, the renewables until 2030, uh, and uh, the uh, phased-in economic transition towards a low-carbon economy. In the field of uh, energy, the Bulgarian presidency continues to act in order to achieve a stable energy uh, European Union and positive results on the uh, agenda of uh, the EU. That includes the initiatives uh, within the uh, legislative and non-legislative package, clean energy for all Europeans. Bulgaria is guided first and foremost by the principle of building an energy union which would provide a secure, reliable, accessible uh, and low carbon energy for all European citizens. We are certain that the European Union the European Energy Union can be sustainable only if it reflects the specifics of the individual countries, when it is based on equality, non-discrimination and technological neutrality. The interconnectivity uh, and regional cooperation are key in order to achieve a well-functioning, secure uh, and affordable uh, energy. The uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy provide excellent opportunities to develop the economies of uh, countries in the Western Balkans. One of the key aspects of this uh, process is uh, complete the completion of interconnectivity of the region. Therefore, we focus on interconnectors in the region. Last but not least, allow me to point out that the National Assembly, the Parliament of the Republic of Bulgaria, is an excellent example for uh, dialogue uh, within the executive branch, uh, for long-term dialogue within the uh, common European policies. Esteemed colleagues, as the Speaker of the Bulgarian uh, House in Parliament, Allow me to open today's conference. It's a privilege to launch these interesting topics for discussion and high-level debates. I sincerely wish every success to you in uh, the uh, work that is ahead of us. Thank you for your attention. Madam Speaker, Ms. Karyancheva, esteemed uh, heads of delegations uh, from the EU member states, from the European Parliament, esteemed uh, representatives of um, uh, candidate countries, dear guests, 
esteemed representatives of the Western Balkans, Your Excellencies, dear guests, as the chairperson of the Energy Committee uh, within the National Assembly of the Republic of Bulgaria, it's an honor to open the meeting, uh, this meeting today. Welcome. I believe we are going to have a uh, an interesting dialogue, which uh, is uh, being carried out within Bulgaria's presidency of the European uh, Union. The topics uh, chosen for today are very important in the context of adopting the legislative package, clean energy for all Europeans. It would also contribute towards better communication, a better awareness of the priorities of the EU, and the transition towards uh, clean energy and interconnectivity. Bulgaria is actively involved in the uh, in conducting the energy policy of the European Union, and uh, in 2015, um, and since 2015, is implementing the framework uh, strategy with the priorities of energy uh, security. Uh, in, energy market, energy efficiency, decarbonization of the economy, uh, research and competitiveness and innovations. Uh, the uh, priorities of a sustainable energy union uh, contains the most important priority, namely clean energy for all Europeans. The eight uh, legislative priorities involve amendments to the legislation, uh, which uh, concerns uh, uh, renewable energy, the model of the energy market, uh, building the legislative framework for managing the um, energy union. All of that aims at uh, retaining uh, the uh, competitiveness of the European Union in the transition towards clean energy. The package of clean energy takes into account uh, that uh, uh, decarbonization of the uh, system aims at uh, um, drawing up benefits for the society as a whole. The security of supply, uh, improving the uh, employment uh, rate, uh, and uh, the uh, contribution towards the development of uh, the uh, European industries. Uh, we expect to see the legislative proposals of the European Parliament, which aim at amendments of uh, uh, the uh, renewables and the regulations of the energy union. Managing the energy union in the area of climate change and the, the energy area are among the top priorities. The proposed regulation to manage the energy union aims at bringing together different legislative acts, which also introduces the requirement for reporting within the energy union. That includes also relieving some of uh, the um, obligations, setting up a, a legislative uh, framework which is based on two main uh, pillars. First, uh, rationalization and uh, reporting and monitoring uh, within the energy sector in relation to the climate change. And second, coordinating the political process of the member states, uh, uh, the Commission and the institutions of the EU in order to achieve uh, the uh, objectives uh, within the climate change and uh, uh, energy area until 2030. This uh, would contribute uh, to to the uh, implementation of the Paris Agreement, which was uh, signed on the 5th of October 2016 uh, and uh, ratified uh, on the 4th of November 2016. It would uh, um, guarantee that no additional administrative burden would be added in implementing uh, these uh, requirements in the area of climate change and energy. And on the other hand, it would guarantee the implementation of um, European values. Um, the national uh, plans uh, 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 under the Bulgarian uh, presidency aims at uh, improving uh, reporting uh, and developing their national activities 
national characteristics in order to achieve the common goals of the European Union in the field of uh, climate change and uh, the uh, energy sector. Bulgaria is making an effort towards achieving the energy union and uh, working on the uh, top um, topical issues within uh, the European agenda. Bulgaria is working uh, towards uh, providing um, affordable, clean um, energy for all Europeans. And some of the, these topics are going to be further developed and discussed in the course of today's meeting. We wish uh, every success to this meeting and thus let us make uh, the smooth transi transition towards the first panel. Energy in infrastructure and uh, uh, security of supply. Uh, the uh, leading uh, pre representatives uh, within uh, this uh, topic are our keynote speaker, uh, the head of the unit for networks and regional initiatives, Ms. Sikovmani, and uh, Mr. Vladimir Uruchev. Ms. Sikovmani, you have the floor. Um, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chairman, honorary members of uh, parliaments, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very honored to be here today to represent the European Commission and bring the messages uh, to you from Brussels. Uh, uh, as we already heard, the clean energy uh, package will bring the necessary framework uh, for Europe to manage the energy transition uh, towards a clean uh, energy system that we need uh, in the very short term. It will allow us to bring the necessary technologies into the system, uh, digitalization to ensure secure to supply, uh, and also to help make uh, consumers into uh, prosumers. Uh, we are confident that uh, under Bulgaria, Bulgarian EU presidency, excellent progress will be made in many of the legislative proposals uh, during the remaining six weeks. Uh, in my short presentation, I will uh, use uh, the regional cooperation uh, in Central Southeastern Europe, which is called SESEC, uh, as the demonstration on how we can, by working together, achieve uh, more than working individually uh, in terms of infrastructure and security supply. It's also very timely to come back to this SESEC uh, regional cooperation given that it was kick-started uh, three years ago here in Sofia. Again, so it's perfect moment to take stock. Um, I think we all know that there are challenges uh, in the gas sector, and gas sector is where the regional cooperation in SESEC started with. Uh, the region has witnessed uh, in 2006 and 2009 already what uh, supply disruption can mean uh, when citizens and businesses are without uh, gas for a lengthy period. The situation, of course, has improved since 2009 considerably, but the vulnerability remains. Uh, the region is also uh, relatively dependent on one source of uh, gas, which leads to lack of competition uh, and therefore also to higher uh, consumer prices uh, to, uh, again, citizens and businesses. We have estimated that if uh, this region would have access to comparable prices as Western Europe, uh, we could save 4 billion euros annually in uh, uh, gas bills. So against this background, the SESEC regional cooperation was put together uh, in 2015. Uh, it focused on gas and it identified seven priority projects that would need to be implemented as the top priority in the region. They are shown in red in this slide. Out of these seven, there are already three which are very well underway, which include uh, so-called TANAP and TAP projects, which will open the Southern Gas Corridor and which will bring uh, gas from Azerbaijan and uh, the Gaspian Basin to Europe. 
the opening will take place uh, very soon in the coming months formally. Uh, also, the so-called Brua Corridor, which connects Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and then beyond to Austria, uh, is currently under construction, so const uh, progress is very good. Uh, and also uh, reinforcements of the Bulgarian uh, ring are underway, and progress there is also uh, very good. What we still need to see happen in order to allow uh, all countries in the region to have access to diversified supply sources is to implement the LNG terminal Kruk and its evacuation pipeline in uh, Croatia. Uh, we need to see uh, Bulgaria-Serbia interconnector uh, start works and also Bulgaria-Greece. Uh, we expect this year to demonstrate the success of this regional cooperation. Uh, later this week uh, in the Western Balkan Summit, which will take place also here in Sofia, uh, we will see good progress on Bulgaria-Serbia. And at the end of June, when the SESEC High Level Group will meet at the ministerial level uh, in Sofia again, we are expecting uh, good progress on uh, Greece-Bulgaria interconnector, uh, which will demonstrate on the one hand what regional cooperation can achieve, and also demonstrate when a committed presidency uh, puts all its efforts into making progress, how successful it can be. Uh, with these gas projects then well underway, we can say that the region will have access to uh, a diversified sources of uh, gas. Uh, it will bring competition to the region, and the competition is expected, of course, to uh, bring competitive prices uh, to citizens and businesses. Uh, I mentioned that uh, if this region had access to comparable prices as Western Europe, one could save 4 billion euro uh, annually. The cost of these seven uh, investment projects is 1.5 billion. So we can rapidly make the calculation that it is a very worthwhile uh, exercise. Uh, so now that gas is well underway and the infrastructure and the market is being uh, properly implemented, uh, SESEC uh, decided, the ministerial level meeting decided uh, a year ago uh, to now uh, focus on uh, how the energy mix through renewables and how the energy usage through more energy efficiency can help in security supply and can further uh, ensure the achievement of the Paris objectives. This region has a huge potential uh, in renewable energy, in wind, in biomass, in hydro, uh, and also in, in solar. Uh, there is much, much more potential to tap into this, uh, uh, these resources, which are, of course, indigenous resources. Uh, they will bring security supply, ensure global leadership uh, of Europe, and uh, help meet Paris uh, agreements. And last but certainly not least, they will promote growth and bring bring local jobs uh, to the region. So therefore, against this background, uh, the SESEC ministerial meeting decided last year in Bucharest to upgrade this regional cooperation to also include electricity, uh, renewables, and energy efficiency. This will help us make citizens uh, at the center of the energy system make Europe number one in renewables, and put energy efficiency first. Governance, which uh, is currently also under negotiation and is going to be completed under the Bulgarian presidency, puts strong emphasis on regional cooperation. And uh, we are very proud also to see that uh, the regional cooperation in SESEC has been one of the uh, good examples uh, 
underpinning our proposal on governance. Uh, the electricity, renewables and energy efficiency work uh, under SESEC is currently focusing on assessing the potential, the huge potential that there exists in the region uh, and making sure that the financing uh, for uh, the different projects are, is in place and can be tapped on. Uh, so this uh, work is ongoing and we'll expect to deliver results at the ministerial meeting end of June. On the infrastructure side, um, we do need well-functioning electricity market, well-interconnected uh, electricity grids in order to uh, make sure that the uh, variability of uh, solar and wind can be best uh, used where, where they are and where they are produced. Uh, Well-interconnected grids and markets will bring security supply uh, in, a, in, a, in a more cost-effective way. And again, we are back to ensuring competitiveness of our uh, energy system, of our economy uh, and growth and jobs. Again, like in, in the gas sector, uh, a number of priority projects uh, in electricity, which are shown on the map, have been identified, which will ensure full integration, full functioning of the market in Central Southeastern Europe. Uh, again, uh, we expect uh, deliverables to be uh, ensured and uh, underpinned in this uh, ministerial meeting of the SESEC uh, cooperation that will take place uh, on the 28th and 29th of June here in Sofia. So from the regional cooperation point of view, uh, this very brief presentation aimed at showing how we can achieve more results more rapidly by working together, uh, by looking at the regional potential, uh, looking together at the regional challenges and finding together uh, solutions. In that way, we can achieve the objectives we have set for the European market more efficiently, more cost efficiently and more rapidly. Uh, so I look very much forward to the upcoming meetings under the Bulgarian presidency where concrete milestones are expected. And I also look forward to a very fruitful discussion today on this very important topic that energy is. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thank you very much uh, Ms. Sikov Magni. I now give the floor to Mr. Uruch. Esteemed Mr. Dobrev, as the host to this uh, important meeting and uh, initiative, colleagues from parliaments of the European Union, colleagues from the European Parliament, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, our topic is energy infrastructure and security of energy supply. Energy security has become a priority on the agenda of the EU and uh, ranked among the first in EU policies after the events of 2006 and especially 2009, when disruptions in the supply of Russian gas impacted adversely and heavily a number of Europe, EU member states. As a response to this, the EU has strengthened its coordination capabilities in order to prevent such crises or to mitigate the consequences if uh, indeed gas supply disruptions occur again. Since then, European legislation has introduced the following mandatory requirements. First, member states must be able to provide for peak gas consumption during temporary disruptions of the largest gas supply infrastructure. This is the well-known rule N-1. Second, 
it is mandatory that there is permanent physical biconditional capacity available on all cross-border interconnections between member states. The European Union continues to import almost half of its energy. Costs amount to about 400 billion euro annually. This makes the EU the biggest global energy importer. Russia is an important supplier of crude oil, natural gas, coal and uranium in the energy dependency of Europe. As an example, gas supplies comprise one-third of the overall European gas import. And for a number of member states, Russia is the main gas source. This dependency on imports is significant. Therefore, any international development can influence the security of supply, negatively and positively alike. For example, the tension in Northern Africa and the Middle East also threaten the security of supply, while uh, the revolution of shale gas and oil in the USA drastically decreased the import of energy resources to the United States of America and this has led to an increase of import to the European Union of cheap coal and has increased interest to sources of liquefied natural gas. The geopolitical developments around the Ukraine the war that has been fueled in its eastern part, the unilateral declarations to stop the gas transit through the Ukrainian territory, the construction of Turkish Stream and uh, the intentions uh, for Nord Stream 2 create serious concern for security of supply in Central and East European states from the potential redrawing of the energy map of Europe. These and other important challenges have led to a single response by the European Union. It was reflected in a strategy and actions to set up the energy union. Union which will achieve reliable uh, provision of affordable, secure and sustainably sourced energy for all Europeans. There are five main dimensions of the energy union. I will list them briefly before I move on to the essence of the infrastructure. The first dimension of the energy union is energy security. This includes new dimensions of solidarity and trust between member states. It includes diversification of energy supplies, coordinated crisis action plans, coordination and transparency in relations with third countries concerning intergovernmental agreements as well. The second dimension is completion of the internal energy market covering full integration of the countries, infrastructural projects on interconnectors and strengthening the energy systems of the different countries, regu regulatory and uh, legislative framework for managing the networks and the functioning of the internal energy market. The third dimension, improving energy efficiency, which is no longer regarded in the light how to use energy more efficiently, but rather how to save energy with clear targets for decreasing energy consumption. Energy saved is a new source of energy. The fourth dimension, decarbonization of energy and economy with clear targets for decreasing the greenhouse gas emissions increasing the use of energy from renewable energy sources as well as combating climate change. And the fifth dimension, promoting research, innovations and competitiveness of the whole European Union. These dimensions for action are mutually related 
and uh, none of them is a single priority or main priority. Nevertheless, we have to say that decarbonization targets and targets for combating climate change take the lead. They largely define uh, the features of the rest of the policies. They aim to assist achieving overall decarbonization of energy of 80 to 90 percent of the economy by 2050. In essence, this means that we have to bring about a revolutionary energy transition in Europe. In practice, this means a new fourth industrial revolution, leaving fossil fuels uh, gradually behind and having a new engine driven by clean electricity. Now, for the electricity infrastructure of the transition and its challenges, Considering uh, the fact that electricity will probably take the lead, the future electricity system is the cornerstone of the energy transition. There are two main challenges here that I would like to address. First, setting up a single electricity market and this requires a well-integrated trans-European network with good interconnections, enabling sufficient cross-border transmission for the functioning of the market, enabling consumers to make use of competitive prices, higher security of supply in case of force majeure circumstances arise, for example, uh, problems with the generators. We have to admit that there is still resistance to the single energy market. The mentality from the past is still here, saying that if a country imports electricity, its energy security is not provided for. But this kind of thinking leads to inefficient decisions at national level to maintain uh, superfluous generators or even building new generators which otherwise would not be necessary for a functioning regional energy market. In order to overcome this type of thinking and in order to achieve the targets for single energy market, there is a significant role of the political framework of the trans-European networks for energy, the so-called 10E. This framework provides a targeted approach to determine and assist the implementation of projects which significantly contribute to good connectivity and strengthening grids in member states. Thus, as a result of objective selection, the most necessary infrastructure projects will be given priority via the mechanism for projects of common interest. This process is objective indeed, and this is shown by the fact that out of 173 projects included in the third list of projects of common interest, 106 of them are in the sphere of electricity. One of the main problems in this area is guaranteeing the peak consumption in every member state at any conditions. It is clear that the combination from internal capacity and imports can provide the most effective solution. And this has to be taken into account in the projects for interconnectors. That is why I welcome the introduction of a criteria stipulating that if the transmission capacity of the interconnectors of a given country is less than 30% of its peak consumption, possibilities to build additional interconnectors must be found. In order to provide strong public support to 
building a single energy market, we have to guarantee that the internal European market will lead to competitive prices of electricity for all Europeans. The tall consumers will benefit from this market in a comparable way. That is why I welcome the introduction of indicative threshold of two euro per megawatt hour for a price gap between countries, regions or auction zones at which priority consideration of the necessity to set up additional interconnectors is launched. The second big challenge to uh, electricity is related to the integration of renewable energy sources. The new renewable energy targets that have to be achieved over the next uh, decade up to 2030 are subject to final negotiations. We are at the stage of the so-called trilogues. Whether the results from the negotiations is 27 or 30 or 35 percent share of final consumption of energy in the EU out of all types of renewable energy sources by 2030, this would not change the fact that more than 50 percent of the gross production of electricity by 2030 must come from renewable energy sources. Analysis show that in order to achieve the targets by 2030, we will have to almost double the capacity of the installed um, generators for renewable energy in the EU when compared against the current levels. In 2016, this amounted to 400 gigawatts. In order to provide a comparison, this is equal to the power of 400 nuclear reactors of the most uh, common 1,000 megawatt type. Hydro energy, which we are well familiar with, currently has 50% share among all renewable energy sources. Its potential has been used almost to the full, so there are limited opportunities for further development. Biomass as renewable energy source also uh, has limited possibilities. The same goes true for geothermal and ocean energy. The other two leading sources of renewable energy are wind and photovoltaics. It's obvious that these will be the renewable energy sources uh, on the basis of which we will achieve uh, the EU targets. In 2016, the installed wind turbines in the EU reached 154 gigawatts, which is 17% of all installed uh, capabilities in the EU. They came second after gas as an energy source with the biggest installed capacity, leaving coal power plants behind. Solar installations in 2016 reached a capacity of more than 100 gigawatts, which is 11% of all installed capabilities in the EU. In the same year, 29% of the gross consumption of electricity in the EU came from renewable sources, almost equal to uh, nuclear energy. Therefore, power systems will have to be able to cope with the biggest renewable energy source challenge this is the intermittency of generating electricity from wind and photovoltaics because they depend on weather and atmospheric conditions. A range of analysis of the profile of this intermittency shows that at regional or national level, this profile is quite broad and dynamic. 
and it will call for significant backup power in order to compensate this intermittency. A common European profile would uh, reduce intermittency because it will take into account the natural geographical uh, weather and atmospheric diversity of the European continent. That is why we can say that uh, managing intermittency of wind and photovoltaic uh, renewable energy sources will be much more successful in an integrated broad, ge geographically speaking, power system rather than managing it locally. In other words, integrating large renewable energy sources in the grids also calls for developing the relevant infrastructure for good interconnection between EU member states. That is why we need to develop a criteria taking into account the factor of integration of renewable energy sources when taking decisions on interconnectors in order to guarantee the best use of renewable energy sources across Europe. Currently, a criterion is proposed under which if the transmission capabilities of interconnectors of a country is smaller than 30% out of the installed capabilities for generating electricity from renewable energy sources. This calls for a priority consideration of the possibilities for additional interconnectors. And this criteria is too uh, generalized. Large-scale integration of renewable energy sources with variable production puts forth a range of other questions to the energy systems. First, what must be the energy mix which will provide a balance between demand and electricity generation in a system with a dominating, domineering share of renewable energy sources with a variable generation? Second, what is the role of electricity storage technologies and uh, for flexible managing of consumption as a way to manage intermittency in generation of electricity from renewable energy sources. What uh, will be the impact of integrating a large amount of intermittent renewable energy sources on the operational security of systems, maintaining the frequency of the grids when there is reduced inertia of the system itself and the ne necessity of backup power? What will be the technical uh, necessity to strengthen the uh, transmission systems uh, and the introduction of smart management in um, electricity distribution networks. How will the current concept evolve, that is the concept of uh, electricity systems for permanent base capabilities and flexible generation for peak uh, load when the dominating share of the generation will be belong to the intermittent renewable energy sources? What capacity of interconnectors will be necessary in order to make use of the geographical diversity of renewable energy sources at European level? And last question, what will be the impact of uh, the broad deployment of wind and photovoltaics on the market prices of energy if the significant costs for their integration are taken into account? These questions will be answered in due time, but it is clear that the analytical models for forecasting energy developments must uh, be reset in order to take into account the specificities of the large-scale presence of renewable energy sources in energy systems, as well as determining the specific requirements to the electricity structure. Now, for the gas infrastructure. In the context of the energy transition and decarbonization, using natural gas will continue to be significant for a number of decades ahead. All member states, apart from the ones for which uh, an exemption is applied, Cyprus, Malta, Luxembourg, Slovenia and Sweden, have met the criteria N-1 for gas supply security and have uh, um, 
already access to two gas sources. Uh, there is a need for special attention to the case of Bulgaria and Finland. Implementing projects of common interest in the next few years uh, might bring about access to three gas sources without Malta and Cyprus, of course. And this would be a significant achievement for energy security, especially for the more vulnerable member states. In the end of the day, the common goal is to put an end to the energy isolation in the eastern part of the Baltic Sea, to integrate the Iberian Peninsula in the European energy market, and last but not least, to improve security of supply in Central and Southeastern Europe. We have to highlight that in the area of gas infrastructure, it is clearly visible that uh, we need projects for internal interconnectors in order to provide security of supplies in Central and Southeastern Europe. At the same time, this region is uh, subject to geopolitical gas interests from third countries in order to maintain levers for impact and have non-competitive markets. Let's uh, remember what happened with Nabucco, its rival South, South Stream. Now let's see the current uh, uh, opposition between the southern gas corridor from Azerbaijan to Italy and uh, the construction of Turkish Stream. It is obvious that uh, this region will carry the greatest impact, will be most heavily impacted by the transit of Russian gas via Ukraine, which can be terminated soon if uh, it is possible to circumvent the Ukraine when transmitting Russian gas to Europe. Because of this clash of interests, all new external gas interconnectors, even if they are fully economically viable, are politically loaded and there are consequences that have to be taken into account. Largely, that is why there is a huge difference in interpreting the proposed new legislation for uh, extending European market rules uh, to sea gas pipelines uh, in the territorial waters and exclusive economic areas in member states. This meeting is held in Bulgaria. Our country continues to be one of the most vulnerable in the EU. That is why I think that for the broader public, we need to provide more information how the security criteria which are part of the European legislation, are met. The criterion N-1, securing gas consumption during temporary disruptions of the largest infrastructure. It is provided for by uh, the gas stocks at the gas storage facility in Chiren, the bidirectionality of connections with Turkey and Greece, the additional uh, connectors with Romania, Greece and Serbia will increase the sustainability of the country on this criteria. Second, for diversifying gas sources and uh, achieving uh, access from at least three sources, currently what is most important is building the new connector with Greece, which will provide access to use of liquefied gas as well as to Azerbaijan gas from the gas pipeline from the southern gas corridor. All connectors with the neighboring countries certainly contribute to integrate the country in the common regional market. And for this, we develop the gas hub Balkan project. But without a good gas um, transmission connector, with the Central Europe, we could hardly speak of creating a competitive gas market in the region. Maybe uh, the broad public is not familiar with this, but uh, as the European Commission representative mentioned before me, there is uh, a project under implementation for corridor for tr carrying natural gas from Bulgaria to Romania, Hungary and Austria, the Brewer project, which is being implemented. 
and the interconnected Bulgaria-Romania is part of this corridor. As a conclusion, I would like to say that implementing the 76 gas projects of common interest in the third list of these projects will bring about real gas security of the regions and the EU, integrating and developing gas markets uh, and achieving uh, fair prices of gas for all consumers. Regarding funding, financial support from the EU is an important factor for implementing crucial energy and gas projects, providing significant socio-economic benefits at regional level. But costs under them cannot be provided for only by the market. The Connecting Europe facility, by the end of last year, it provided grants for research and works on 74 projects of common interest to the amount of 1.6 billion euro. With the assistance of this instrument, private investments can be attracted for the purposes of creating energy infrastructure. A good example of this is the gas corridor Brua from Bulgaria to Austria, which I already mentioned. The Connecting Europe facility provided grants amounting to 179 million euro for this project. And later this led to a mobilization of 100 million euro more through the European Fund for Strategic Investment private funding. The European Regional Development Fund also provides support for energy projects of common interest and many member states make use of this possibility. All in all, the EU has a good uh, system for funding developments of the most significant energy infrastructure. In conclusion, achieving the 2020 and 2030 targets, namely 10 and 15 percent uh, interconnections, is of key importance for competitiveness, security of energy supply and the integration of more renewable energy sources. The revolutionary transition to clean energy cannot be brought about without well-integrated trans-European electricity grids and networks, without adequate, modernized, digitized and smart energy infrastructure. According to estimates, by 2030, investments amounting to the huge 180 billion euro will be necessary. This means that um, significant political, legislative and regulatory support will be called for in order to provide the success of the energy transition. We've seen from experience that the fastest and most efficient way to achieve success is when we work within deep and regional cooperation. This uh, cooperation must be strengthened and systemically supported at all levels. I didn't talk about nuclear energy, but I would like to mention in my conclusion the following. Nearly half of the clean electricity produced in the EU is provided for by nuclear energy. Nuclear energy has a significant contribution for decarbonization, but it is not viewed as a possible common European decision. At the same time, member states are free to use the nuclear option in order to achieve the goals of their energy transition, together with the development of renewable energy sources, if this option is economically uh, well-reasoned and acceptable for public opinion. And public opinion varies greatly between member states, and it is capable of uh, affecting the uh, respective political reactions and decisions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your interesting uh, presentations, for your visionary approach. Uh, for what you have said. Yeah? And now I would like to give the floor, to open the floor for discussions. We will begin with uh, Adam Gwede, Poland. Ladies and gentlemen, the main aspect that can ensure uh, energy security vis-a-vis -vis the outside is, of course, diversification of sources 
of uh, gas and oil, but also uh, solid fuels such as coal. In our approach to energy security and ensuring energy independence, we need to act consistently and Poland is seeking to ensure its uh, independence by reducing the dependence on sources from the East, which is something that is important not just for Poland but for other countries in Central Europe as well. Now, the Baltic Pipe Project is a key project for us for reliable supply of natural gas from uh, of the outside, and that is important for our partners in Central Europe as well. Uh, the building of the LNG uh, terminal in Świnoujście, together with the Baltic Pipe, uh, are part of our uh, so-called Northern Gate way concept and that is something that can supply not just uh, Polish clients uh, but also clients uh, in uh, states bordering Poland whether they be members of the EU or not and we believe that we need to strengthen our cooperation our energy cooperation with the partner countries lying to the east of poland that are not members of the eu there has to be closer and closer cooperation in the areas of natural gas oil and also electricity poland's energy security will be strengthened by the revision of the gas directive. That should be done in a way that would introduce equal, transparent, and clear legal frameworks for all stakeholders in the energy markets. It is Poland's position that the EU law must uh, apply to all gas uh, connections, uh, gas uh, pipelines uh, within the EU and also between the EU and third countries, uh, uh, be they uh, land gas lines or uh, marine ones such as Nord Stream 2. We believe that Nord Stream 2 should not uh, exist in a legal vacuum that uh, results in an unequal playing field which is not acceptable. And another aspect of Poland's energy security that is extremely important for us uh, is uh, an uh, certainty of uh, supply of uh, solid fuels uh, such as uh, both uh, uh, brown coal and lignite. Uh, our Western uh, neighbors, uh, Germany imported 34 million tons of uh, this uh, uh, raw material a few years ago, and now it's up to 53 million tons. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, dependence uh, there. And the closing of coal mines, uh, uh, which is something that is being imposed on us uh, by the European Commission, is resulting in a lot of imports and more dependence, more energy dependence uh, uh, on countries lying to the east. Obviously, we need to find appropriate solutions using uh, modern technologies to improve energy efficiency to reduce the CO2 emissions. That is something that is entirely acceptable for Poland, the use also of uh, co-generation. And thanks to these new modern technologies, it will be possible to reduce uh, CO2 emissions uh, in a systemic fashion that is uh, technologically possible. We are on a very good path uh, to energy transformation and the uh, 
objectives uh, set for us uh, by the European Commission in this respect uh, are acceptable, but we uh, want to introduce uh, uh, modern technologies over a reasonable uh, time frame. Insofar as renewable sources of energy are concerned, they also have to be consistent with reasonable objectives. I mean, it looks uh, quite different in the south of Europe, in the north of Europe, and in the center of Europe. Wherever this is possible, we have to look uh, for the best possible solutions using modern technologies, but that are uh, adapted to the uh, situations in individual countries. Now, Mr. Uh, Vladimir Urutchev uh, has talked about uh, these uh, uh, four areas uh, that's, uh, that are crucial, but uh, we are convinced uh, that um, there are two particularly important vectors that must be taken into consideration, namely that of uh, technological transformation and the uh, temporal vector. Uh, if you want to save the climate, uh, you cannot uh, do this by uh, imposing the same conditions in all states. We have the same common objectives, but the way we reach or achieve those objectives must be tailor-made for each country. Every uh, country has its own um, renewable energy potential, and that can be quite different from one country to another. Uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. In some uh, countries, uh, aeolian energy is more appropriate. In others, it's uh, solar. So when we uh, work on energy integration within the EU, those differences are crucial and must be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaveda. I now give the floor to Mr. Mat Mateski. Um, I would like to ask you to please uh, keep your uh, speeches shorter. We have about uh, two to three minutes per person, and uh, we have a double number of uh, speakers from what we see here. Thank you. Szanowni Państwo, ladies and gentlemen, it is Poland's position that the European Commission uh, should not give in to Gazprom uh, and not accept uh, the fact uh, that uh, uh, anti-monopoly rules are being broken by Gazprom when it uh, uh, supplies uh, gas uh, to Poland and many other EU states. Uh, it is engaged in monopoly practices. Uh, this is a case uh, that uh, has been going on for seven years. Uh, and uh, the European uh, Commission could uh, impose a uh, fine of uh, several billion euros, 10% uh, of the overall turnover. But instead of a fine, the Commission is thinking of uh, pardoning Gazprom on conditions uh, set by uh, Gazprom. The uh, Commissioner, uh, Margaret Vestager, responsible uh, for competition, agreed to this. And in the agreement, there are only cosmetic changes. There is no real opening of a free market for gas. And uh, these um, uh, decisions by the European Commission are very damaging for the countries uh, uh, that receive gas from Gazprom. Uh, we can only see uh, one good reason for this, uh, uh, namely that uh, the money saved by not paying a fine will be used uh, to build Gazprom 2, which will result in a further uh, dependence of EU states on Gazprom. Uh, so the pardoning of Gazprom for its breaking of the rules uh, is in fact uh, going to enrich uh, Gazprom and uh, tie us uh, more closely to Gazprom. Today's uh, speakers have mentioned that this uh, uh, gas line, this gas connection will avoid Central and Eastern European countries. And I would also add that Nord Stream 2 uh, is a threat uh, to Ukraine and Ukraine's uh, independence. Uh, the uh, competition laws uh, that we have uh, were enacted in order to to protect uh, EU states, and yet it is uh, the Russian uh, conglomerate uh, 
that uh, proposed the outcome, what the outcome of the monopoly investigation should be. It wasn't DG Comp did that. We were convinced in Central and Eastern Europe uh, that uh, this uh, monopoly would be broken. This has not been done. Uh, and the European Commission is in error when it believes that giving in to Gazprom will result uh, uh, in uh, Gazprom no longer breaking the rules. But uh, Nord Stream 2 is not a viable project, and uh, any opening further opening of European markets uh, to uh, Gazprom is a threat uh, to the existence uh, of a free market and it is a threat uh, to the uh, continued existence of an independent Ukraine. And so the uh, decisions of the European Commission are crucial for energy security of the EU and for uh, a future independent Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to uh, Mr. Charua. My name is Harula Kafadari. I come from Greece. Uh, good morning to all. EU specific targets for 2030 in accordance with the 2016 Paris Agreement, COP21. Within this context, the shift to renewable energy sources and the change of energy mix at the expense of fossil fuels should be considered as mandatory. A key priority in the European Union's energy unification, electricity, natural gas, etc., and the management of energy dependency from third countries, which makes it essential to diversify the supply sources. Hence, it is necessary to redesign the electrical power market to be interconnected and flexible. flexible. Greece, because of its excellent geographic location, is capable of making a de decisive contribution to EU's energy supply security and to, and to diversification of sources. The construction of the TAP natural gas pipeline is advancing and therefore transferring natural gas from Azerbaijan, while the new vertical IGB pipeline is on to go. Furthermore, I would like to inform you that during the recent tri trilateral meeting between Cyprus, Israel and Greece, it was decided that the East Med pipeline construction will be signed in 2018. Thus, natural gas from southeastern Mediterranean will be transferred to Europe. At the same time, the Euroasia interconnector, a major electrical interconnection plan, will be coupled with a fiber optic cable for data transferring is also designed. These connections eliminate energy isolation of Cyprus and contribute to Europe's energy security by diversifying its sources of supply. In addition, it brings Central European consumers closer to the energy produ producers of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kafantari. Sorry about the mistake with your name. Now I give the floor to Mr. Angelos Votsis. Cyprus. Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I would like to express my appreciation to the Bulgarian Presidency for the organization of the meeting and the hospitality bestowed upon us. I am pleased to address this meeting on a crucial, crucial issue at hand. In the last few years, the Eastern Mediterranean region has developed into a potential gas hub due to, to significant natural gas discoveries offshore Israel, Cyprus, and Egypt. In this context, Cyprus has established ge geostrategic energy partnerships and has intensified regional cooperation with the neighbor neighboring countries. Cyprus, as both as an uh, European Union member and a Mediterranean country, has the potential to play a key role in the Union's energy security and gas supply and diversification strategy. 
This is mutually beneficial for the European Union and for the Eastern Mediterranean region, as it reinforces the materialization of the European Union neighborhood policy through the cons consolidation of the founding values and principles of the Union in this geopolitically volatile region. It also serves as a peace-building factor and as a catalyst for regional cooperation, promoting stability and security in this turbulent area. Unfortunately, our efforts to safeguard the Union's energy security and efficiency are hindered by Turkish provocative actions within Cyprus' exclusive economic zone. Cyprus' licensing rounds have garnered strong interest from foreign investors. Global energy giants such as French Total, United States firm Noble Energy, Israeli Delec, and consortium of Italian Eni and South Korean Kokas, and the United Kingdom Dutch company Royal Dutch Shell and ExxonMobil Qatar Petroleum have already secured research and, exp and exploration rights in Cyprus' exclu exclusive economic zone. In this context, I would like to welcome the recent March 2018 European Union Council call on Turkey to seize these actions and to respect the sovereign rights of Cyprus to explore and exploit its natural resources in accordance with the European Union international law. If Turkey aspires to become a European Union member, it has to fulfill its obligations towards the European Union and to normalize its relations with Cyprus as stipulated in the negotiation framework for, Tur for Turkey adopted by the European Union on October 3, 2005. Last but not the least, I would like to stress the urgent need to work in synergy in order to remove all remaining obstacles to the completion of the internal energy market, the realization of, of energy infrastructure projects such as the Eurasia Interconnector must be prioritized. Cyprus is a small isolated market as an island country without any connection to European or other energy networks, electricity, petroleum, natural gas. The implementation of the Eurasia Interconnector project is of at most importance as it will lift this isolation and permit further penetration of renewable energy sources. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Votsis. Now I give the, door, the floor to Mr. Zia Autaniodas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, Turkey's energy policy is based on energy supply security. We want to contribute to energy security of Europe as well. Diversification of energy supply sources and rules is one of the main pillars of Turkey's energy strategies. In this regard, we attach priority to Trans-Anatolian Natural Gas Pipeline, the backbone of the Southern Gas Corridor. The timely and simultaneous realization of TAP is equally important. TANAP is, sought to be, is set to become operational on June 12, 2018. Promoting the use of renewable, renewables and nuclear energy while increasing our energy efficiency are other important strategies to achieve energy supply security. We attach utmost importance to energy cooperation in Black Sea as well. A high level of project this Turkish stream is currently underway, and the gas to, to be transported through the first line will substitute the gas Turkey currently receives through the western route and will not bring additional reliance on Russian gas. And we have no doubt that TANAP and Turkish stream project will contribute to regional prosperity and stability as well as the supply security of Europe. And despite all warnings, the Greek Cypriot administration continues its unilateral hydrocarbon-related activities in the Eastern Mediterranean. It does so in, in this regard of the inalienable rights on natural resources of Turkish Cypriot people who are the co-owners of the island. And furthermore, Turkish Cypriot side has made two calls of cooperation to, to Greek Cypriot side for equitable sharing of the natural resources. On 24 September 2011 and 29 September 2012, 
and Greek Cypriot side, however, has not responded positively to these calls up to date. It is not acceptable that the Greek Cypriot side uses the economic crisis it's facing as an opportunity to create new faith of accomplish. The only way to exploit the natural resources of the island before any settlement flows through an agreement in line with the proposals made by the Turkish Cypriot side in 2011 and 12 under the auspices of UN Secretary General, and thus through getting the clear consent of Turkish Cypriot side regarding the sharing of these natural resources. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to Thomas Kivimaji, um, Estonia. Honorable uh, hosts, honorable colleagues, and uh, key speakers, um, my, actually, I have a question to Madame Sikov Magni. Uh, you mentioned that uh, security and uh, continuity of a supply of energy, including gas, is, in my opinion, not less important than uh, economical aspects. And you mentioned correctly that uh, right now one of the bigger risks is uh, to peak dependence uh, on one gas supplier. And uh, to lower this risk, we need uh, to diversify, we need more gas suppliers. And you are making some concrete steps towards that. But uh, it looks a bit uh, controversial because on the one hand, you are looking for uh, more gas suppliers. But on the other hand, uh, European Union increases the dependence on the bigger gas supplier. I'm talking about the Russia. And uh, I'm talking about the Nord Stream 2. What's your position? What's the position of your unit uh, if we're talking about Nord Stream 2, especially in the aspect of security and continuity of gas supply? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sikov Magni, would you like to see? Would you like to respond, please? Thank you very much for the, the, the question. Um, I think uh, what I tried to emphasize uh, in my intervention this morning, although it focused on the Central Southeastern Europe, the measures are equivalent in other parts of Europe, including Eastern Baltic uh, Sea region, whereby uh, the most important and the priority for us is to ensure that all EU member states have access to, uh, through infrastructure, uh, at least three sources of gas. And these different projects of common interest uh, that are being put in place are to ensure that access. Uh, projects of common interest are our tool, European policy tool, to make this happen. Uh, Nord Stream 2 is not a project of common interest. It has never been proposed uh, to become a project of com common interest. Therefore, it is not uh, a project that our policy framework uh, would uh, support or would enable at all. So for us, the most important remains to make sure that uh, Europe is well integrated, that all EU member states can get access to uh, two, three gas source, sources, one of which is LNG typically, and the project of common interest, the trans-European networks, are the tool to implement these priorities. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to Mr. Fernando Carlos Rodriguez Perez, Spain, please. Gracias, buenos dias. Thank you. Good morning. Two questions for Ms. Katerin, Katerina Seekov Magni. How we, what, how are we making progress? How much progress are we making in the techniques for storage of energy? And secondly, what is the situation of gas transport from North Africa to the European Union? Ms. Magni, we have a second question, please. Thank you very much uh, for your questions. Um, on storage, um, uh, we do have a strategy uh, in place to ensure sufficient uh, storage in, in gas on the one hand. And again, a number of projects of common interest have been identified uh, in this respect. We are increasingly working on electricity storage and all the new 
technologies that are coming on stream. Uh, and again, there more and more projects of common interest have been identified uh, in electricity, which will then help us integrate the renewables and also ensure security supply that way. Uh, on your second question on gas uh, from Northern Africa, uh, we do have uh, already existing uh, connections to uh, Libya on the one hand and Algeria on the other hand, so through Spain on the one hand and through Italy on the other hand. Uh, for the time being, these uh, pipelines are being utilized, however, not to their full capacity. So therefore, there is still a possibility to increase uh, these capacities, uh, and we are uh, actively discussing with our Northern African uh, neighbors uh, to make sure that uh, the exploration on the one hand and then the transmission of uh, gas is taking place. But I would like to also emphasize that it is very important to uh, cooperate also in electricity with the Northern African countries uh, on the one hand to allow us to export uh, our uh, surplus uh, renewables, for instance, but also in the longer term to possibly import also from Northern Africa uh, to Europe. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to Mr. Klaus Ernst, Germany. Well, a very good morning, dear colleagues. Now, for reasons of time, there's just one topic I'd like to deal with, and that's Nord Stream 2. Now, I take the view to start off with that this uh, uh, pipeline doesn't uh, need to be described as um, a common interest uh, project for the European Union because it's completely privately funded. Now, there's no need for European public money to support that, the Nord Stream project. Now, um, for years, uh, we in Germany have stable economic relations with uh, Russia for energy delivery. Russia has been a very reliable energy partner for us for decades now. Thirdly, what is the alternative? Now, I can see in the United States a lot of gas and oil is being produced, and of course, it's that's in the US's interest uh, to deliver that as well to Europe. But we know that LNG gas, uh, if you compare it with Russian gas, does bring with it far more environmental problems than Russian gas. And for these reasons, there's no need, as things currently stand, for us to import gas from the US at the moment. And American LNG gas, if we were to import it, there's, well, there's no need. And uh, if one looks at relations with Russia in other areas, um, it still doesn't mean that we can identify the U.S. as a more reliable partner necessarily. And the justifications that the European Union used in order to hinder this uh, new energy transport pathway, namely the um, uh, relevant directives, was rejected by the EU's own legal service. And so there's no legal way to block Nord Stream to either. Furthermore, I know that every country but one, all of the other countries uh, have fulfilled the technical requirements for such a pipeline to be built. And so one can't use legal reasons. You can't cite them to stand in the way of this pipeline being built. It's a privately funded project completely. That's the first point. Secondly, it's in the interests of uh, our future gas supply. In fact, it's necessary. And thirdly, it doesn't it doesn't exclude any other uh, pipelines because Nord Stream 2 wouldn't be enough to guarantee our gas security. And fourthly, I assume this pipeline will be built. Thank you. I give the floor to Mr. Taskurmenko from Bulgaria. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, as a logical 
follow up to what we heard from Mr. Klaus Ernst, allow me to draw your attention to three other aspects of the security of supply. First of all, the security of supply cannot be based on the opposition of different options. And uh, we can't really say TAP or TANAP or North Stream or South Stream or uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG, because this is not going to result into secure supply or uh, more affordable prices. The solutions should mean the meet the requirements of each geographical region so that the gas and energy prices would indeed be affordable. So we're not only talking of natural gas, we're talking of power as well. Second, we have to remember that security of supply is not only diversification of sources, but diversification of routes as well. Because the fewer transit countries, non-EU member states are involved, the fewer risks there will be in the energy transit. Thirdly, EU solidarity in energy security should be expressed in identical approach in supplies, regardless of whether the North or the South is concerned. Every nation has the right to security of supply at affordable prices for the respective nation, regardless of whether the nation happens to be in the North, the South, or, or the Central of Europe. And if the European Commission is going to carry out this kind of policy, I think that many of the problems and challenges that the EU and the European Commission are faced with would be resolved. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Menkov. I see no other participants requesting the floor. Therefore, let us take our coffee break and our family photo. Let's begin with the photo first. We will resume at 11 o'clock with the second session of today's meeting. Thank you.